Well, thank you for all coming uh, so soon after lunch. Um, I'm Andrew Hoppen. I'm uh, with New Amsterdam Ideas. Uh, we're a, call ourselves the Open Civic Platforms Company. Basically, what that means is we help governments and nonprofit or civic organizations to implement open software solutions, uh, most notably Drupal. Um, we're part of a consortium of other organizations, uh, many of them nonprofit, who are also focused on so called civic technology. Um, many of which you probably heard of, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation, Code for America, Open Plans, um, and a number of others. And so we really feel like we're part of this a, a really vibrant civic tech community movement right now, which is really exciting for us. Um, in particular today, we're going to talk about two Drupal distributions that we built to help uh, not only contribute to uh, civic technology work for our customers, governments, but also to help uh, to make the civic technology development process uh, more efficient and more systematized itself. Um, so it's a little, a little bit meta what we're going to talk about today. Um, to give you some context and some background, I'm going to just give you a really brief history from our perspective of uh, civic tech platforms, um, or as we like to call it, trying to make governments work like the web. Right? The web works very well, and we want to take some lessons learned from why it works so well and apply those to making our governments work better. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, the architecture of the web is based on open standards, right? And that's one of the reasons we think that it works so well. Um, and it really serves as a platform to build on, as, as we all know. Um, and our open civic hypothesis, if you will, is that when you combine open standards, open source software, uh, community collaboration, uh, and open data, that you are, have created a foundation for civic innovation, which can drive uh, better software, to make our governments work better and hopefully at lower cost as well. Um, and in a nutshell, that's what we're up to. Uh, the US federal government spends about $180 billion on, on technology every year, just the US federal government alone. Um, meanwhile, you know, uh, getting better, thankfully, today in the US, but in, uh, starting in 2008, more or less, uh, we hit a real economic crisis in the US. And of course, that continues to ripple through a lot of the world. So there's an imperative to uh, not improve government simply by throwing more money at the problem, but actually to do uh, government technology more efficiently. And there's a huge cost uh, sort of baseline that we're working from. And at the same time, of course, when we're in economic uh, tough times, uh, government services are needed more than ever. Um, you know, tough economic times are really when people and communities rely on government services um, for, for help most of all. So better government, more, uh, less money doing it. Um, I'm going to give you three different examples of how we've seen civic tech uh, to help to make a dent in some of these problems. Um, a lot in the US has happened uh, out of the White House's leadership, as you heard yesterday from Macon Phillips on video and in the Dries note. Um, uh, President Obama issued the Open Government Directive in his first month in office in January of 2009, and that really has been a, a led to a lot of uh, opening up of, da of government data. Um, ever since, and of course it was done through a Drupal website, whitehouse.gov. Our team was doing at the same time, starting in 2009, something very analogous in a very local backwater of government, the New York State Senate, and we rolled out a brand new Drupal site for nysenate.gov, um, which we like to think sort of set a new standard for openness, transparency, and ability to participate in uh, legislatures, you know, the, the bodies that make laws at the state level in the U.S. Um, and then we actually collaborated with the White House, and that kind of collaboration goes on today between local, state, and federal government around Drupal specifically. We're actually sharing code on Drupal.org and leveraging off of each other's work so we don't have to pay twice to build the same government-specific functionality on top of Drupal. Um, another example more recently, as you heard in the Dries note yesterday as well, is the uh, White House We the People site, or the White House Petition site, which has helped to sort of, uh, create a new way that uh, U.S. citizens can get involved in petitioning their government for change, or at least for answers, on uh, on things that are important to them. And this has now been turned into a distribution on Drupal.org, right? So that other other governments can now take it and make use of it at very low marginal cost to re-implement it for themselves. Um, we've helped the White House with that by creating a white label theme to go on top of that uh, distribution, so that you don't have to strip out the White House branding and everything when you take that distribution from Drupal.org. And more broadly, Drupal is really becoming the de facto content management system for governments all around the world. We've got the AGOV distribution in Australia, the Web Experience Toolkit in Canada, 
open public distribution, which is widely adopted in the US, as well as the White House's own 44 theme, so-called, that it's going to be using across all of its White House websites. Uh, and it's about a quarter of all US federal.gov websites are now running Drupal. So uh, Drupal's playing a huge role in, in, in government or civic technology, uh, clearly. A couple other realms that have nothing to do with Drupal, though, um, that I think are equally important in terms of seeing the model for how civic innovation and civic tech can work. Right here in Portland, the TriMet agency that we've all been riding around on with our, our uh, train passes all week um, was one of the first to open up its, its uh, schedule data. And uh, in, by, because they did that, they were able to, uh, well, they participated actually in the creation of the general transit feed specification which is why if you use Google Maps on your phone, you're able to see when your next bus or your next train is coming in, in most cities in the US. And that really started right here in Portland. And over time, it, because it was an open standard, propagated all over the US and is now literally a standard. Um, so a really key aspect of civic innovation is open standards. And here in Portland, for, people did all kinds of innovative things that the city might not have thought to do or had the budget to do, but that local developers, civic hackers, if you will, decided it would be cool or useful. Like this guy put a sign in his bakery that told the patrons inside when the next bus was gonna arrive outside so they could figure out when to pay their check and get up so that they could go outside to meet their bus. Um, this is an app that would uh, change your wake up time so that if there are delays in the transit system, it would wake you up earlier so that you'd still get to work on time. Um, this also propagated to New York where an organization that I'm involved with, Open Plans, built a system called Bus Time, which is now what New York City uses to help uh, schedule, uh, help people figure out when their bus is coming in New York City. And it was built on an open modular architecture with open standards and open APIs, not at all the traditional way that New York City Department of Transit or, mo or most cities would typically build their uh, enterprise you know, uh, bus management system. Um, so it was really different, and that's enabled that technology to be reused and propagate to a lot of cities very quickly. And it's also allowed, again, civic hackers to do really innovative things. Um, like when this uh, data was released in New York City, um, somebody called up in plans and said, hey, it's great uh, that um, you could use a smartphone to see when the bus is coming, but she had a feature phone and she wanted to be able to text to get the schedule result. And so within 24 hours, a uh, developer came up with that application to enable that you know, much lower tech, uh, lower, lower barrier to entry access to that schedule information. So again, it opened up innovation. Uh, third and final example I want to give is Open 3 on 1. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a new standard for uh, people reporting to their government issues like, uh, you know, there's a tree down in this street, there's a pothole over here, or even, you know, any non-emergency issue um, is thought of as a 3 on 1 uh, report. And there's an open standard for that called Open 3 on 1, and an open API standard that is now being adopted um, around the country and now around the world. And that has enabled a huge uh, burgeoning movement of application development to use that 3-on-1 data and to contribute to that 3-on-1 data in all kinds of innovative ways. And so we've got you know, literally hundreds of apps that are based on open 3-on-1 that are being built, most of them not being built with government tax dollars at all, but be, by being built by developers who are building it for their own purposes, either to create a new business or simply to contribute to their community. So in tw circa 2013, hundreds of cities are participating in the civic tech movement. Uh, thousands of apps, 10,000s of developers, hundreds of thousands of data sets have gone into this. Um, so that's all great. It sounds really good, right? Uh, but we know we work on a lot of these sort of backwaters of government, you know, the places where things are still done in a very traditional way. Um, and most civic tech projects still look like this. You know, big spreadsheets, you know, 58 page requirements documents for one single feature, you know, 178 page RFPs, waterfall processes, you know, expectation of proprietary. Uh, uh, licenses, et cetera. And so we're still, I think, tip of the iceberg in terms of the cost savings and the efficiency benefit that civic tech innovation can possibly deliver. And that's what we're trying to contribute to. We're trying to really create a distributed innovation cycle between government itself, industry, and communities or citizens so that innovation can happen in any of those three realms and benefit each of those other two of the three legs of the stool. And we've seen this happen historically in a way that makes us feel really good about the future. So GPS data, of course, was one of the first government data sets to be opened up and now is fundamental to so many things that we do. Weather data uh, was another big one that has enabled you know, weather.com to exist. And actually, I think we heard last week that weather.com is now going Drupal, which is really cool. Um, transit data, I already spoke about open three-on-one data I spoke about and government content management 
systems and content publishing I spoke about. So we're really interested in what's next. What are the next civic tech platforms that can be reinvented in this way? Um, and we want to make sure that when somebody comes up with a great new idea in Portland, it's uh, more likely than not that it is actually going to get uh, discovered and adopted by New York or London or any other part of the world. So how do we foster that government-to-government -government technology reuse? And I'm going to turn it over to Sheldon Rampton to uh, talk to you about how we think that we can help to systematize that and make that more the rule than the exception. Hi. So uh, the Open Civic is a distribution of Drupal. You can get it on drupal.org right now. And it's a generalization of some work that we began doing a couple of years ago to build a, an application catalog. Uh, and we chose to build it in Drupal first because we're Drupal developers. But I think, but Drupal, both as a, as software and as a community, inspired a lot of what we did. Um, the the problem that we've been trying to solve, as Andrew said, is that there is a great deal of innovation happening, but not enough happening to share innovation between people. So people end up reinventing the world. So there's kind of an embarrassment of riches and a difficulty in finding things. And, uh, and so we were approached a couple of years ago uh, to build uh, a, a website for, uh, for, for Civic Commons, a nonprofit organization that specializes in addressing civic issues. And the, the fundamental problem we were trying to address was, you know, for people to share software, they have to know that it exists. One of the inspirations for this is the experience that Apple had with its app store. And if, for those who don't remember the history, it's worth remembering that when Apple first came out with the iPhone, it didn't have an app store. The only applications on it were the apps that Apple itself shipped with the platform. And they actually had to be talked into adding an app store and resisted it because they were afraid of security concerns. And Steve Jobs himself had to be convinced that it was a good idea to, to let third party developers add apps to their precious you know, shiny toy. Um, and since then, uh, you know, the, the rise in the number of apps on that store and, the, and Apple's profits from selling, or from a sh share in selling those apps is, have both skyrocketed to the point that uh, you, you see more people these days walking around playing with iPhones apps than you see eating McDonald's. Um, so the, the goal for this apps catalog was to create a, a similar marketplace only for civic solutions that solve civic problems. And in figuring out how to build it, we wanted to address the problems of, of, of communities and finding the right software. And we were, as I said, inspired in part by Drupal. You know, I, I think the, the Drupal project pages are a good prototype of, of a way that you find software and find out what's being used. It's very helpful when you go to a, a project page on Drupal. You can see how many people have downloaded it and how many websites are using it. So we incorporated some, incorporated some of those elements into what we built, which is the app catalog for government-to-government -government applications reuse, uh, originally hosted by Civic Commons and then uh, taken over more recently by, by Code for America. Uh, and and it's a place where you can find listings of applications, listings of, and information about how they're being used. And the, 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 uh, the motto on the homepage is, let's find out what's working and where. And as you can see in this slide, you can see applications listed like, you know, WordPress or SharePoint and a whole bunch of others, proprietary as well as open source. And you can also see a list of cities and other governments that are using the software. Uh, there are hundreds of apps that have been added to the marketplace in hundreds of cities. Uh, and it ranges from very generic software like Microsoft Word to some very specific things like the op Adopt a Hy Hydrant app, which is an application that maps the locations of fire hydrants so that after a snowstorm, volunteers can go and dig them out and have them ready in case there's a fire. Um, so initially when we built this, we thought we were just building one website and that it would be the place where kind of every government in the world would go to, to catalog what they're doing by way of what software they're using and share that information 
with other government uh, software users and buyers. Uh, and our vision on this began to change when we had some conversations with the word World Bank, which ended up saying, uh, initially they approached us because they wanted to organize a hackathon. Uh, and, and as we were talking about their requirements for that, we sort of discovered that the data architecture behind this applications catalog was pretty similar to the data architecture needed to build the hackathon website. And we realized that applications catalogs and hackathons have a fair amount in common. They're both, you know, in, at least for civic software, the, a hackathon is a place where people come together to build applications to solve civic needs. And a catalog is a place where people go to find applications that have already been built to solve civic needs. So uh, with that realization, uh, the goal became to build a, a distribution of Drupal that could be used to spin up multiple hackathon websites, multiple applications catalogs, so that anyone now can use this to spin up a, a website to serve these needs in less than an hour. Uh, the, the application catalog part of it contains three main components. Software applications, uh, organizations, and deployments. Where an organization might be a city government, it might be a team that has built an application, it might be a, a, a vendor that provides s installation and configuration services related to an organization. Uh, and then a deployment is a specific installation of that software to serve a per specific purpose. So for example, whitehouse.gov is one deployment of Drupal. And by sharing these inf pieces of information, people can see what's being used, who's using it. You can contact the, the city government that's, that's using it, ask them about their experiences. And if they say, oh, we had a terrible experience, you stay away. And if they say, it's worked out great and saved us a lot of money, then, then you might want to do the same thing yourself. Um, so uh, the hackathon website that we built with this was a sanitation hackathon uh, sponsored by the website, you can, or excuse me, sponsored by the World Bank. You can see a map here of the places around the world where, it was, where this hackathon was, was held. Uh, this is to address problems ranging from lack of access to clean water to, uh, you know, um, one of the problem categories that is significant in the third world was public defecation. Uh, hand washing was another problem category. Uh, and the, the idea of the hackathon was that first people, w there was a, initially a phase where people uh, who were experts in the field of sanitation would post problem statements saying, you know, this is a problem in this, you know, that's affecting sanitation. After the problem phase, then people would post proposed uh, projects to fix the, those problems, software projects, or, and then, then they would break into teams and work on those projects to see what they could build in the hackathon. Um, so here's how we see this whole ecosystem fitting together, uh, or at least initially we saw it this way, that there would be the, the big applications catalog that would, would be the, where you would find working applications that are actually ready for deployment. And you can find this information about applications, about organizations, and, and deployments for mature apps. And hackathon projects would be uh, organized to solve some problem in some area like sanitation, or domestic violence, or transportation, or any of the other thousand areas where you know, civic services are needed and problems need to be solved. And the hackathon's websites, you know, define problems and projects and teams to so solve them. They have access to the applications catalog to find existing software that might address those, but they also develop new, uh, new, uh, new projects to, and new code. And, and a project as, as we are conceiving it now is essentially an application in embryo. It's, it's a proto-application which when it becomes mature enough, gets pushed into the apps catalog and shared with everyone else. Um, this in turn raises an interesting question that's a standards question, which is how do you share 
and sync con content between what is now multiple websites. And this is also one of the reasons why we felt it was important to build a distribution for Drupal, because if you have multiple websites trying to sync content, it helps a lot if those websites share some similar data structures and standards for defining what is an application, and, and it, it makes it a lot easier if, if, all of the, if all of the hackathon websites have a, a, a common enough definition of that that they, can, they, that they can do a consistent job of pushing that information up to the applications catalog and, and then pulling applications back down. Um, so here's another website we, we built with the, with the Open Civic distro. Uh, we were able to build this entire website in three weeks, including theming and customization. And I th it was rather gratifying to realize that, that we could do something pretty quickly for something that is uh, actually hosting I, I, hundreds of hackathons in the United States uh, just in, what, about a week and a half. Uh, so mark your calendars. Uh, one of the things that they asked us to do with this website as well was, in addition to just po posting challenges to build applications, they also wanted to be able to post data sets. Because as Andrew mentioned, if you have a problem like transportation uh, in a city, having a, a software application by itself is a lot less powerful than having a, uh, having that coupled with the data about where the buses are, are are and when they're arriving. So, being able to share data sets as well as applications was something that we were asked to do for this project, and that is a recurring need that we're also addressing, and that Aaron is going to talk about when he comes on stage. So, uh, wrapping up, what uh, we're trying to do with this now is a number of things, but it, it's raised the question in our mind of whether the application catalog that part of this can actually improve the hackathon business model. We've talked to a number of people who've organized hackathons, and a fairly common point of frustration is that the hackathon itself tends to generate a lot of energy and enthusiasm and new ideas and a lot of great proof of concept code that then doesn't mature into fully f fully developed applications because after the hackathon is over, people have to go back to their day jobs, and uh, they don't necessarily have the time to fully flesh out their uh, their idea. So there are a couple of components that are necessary in order to translate all these great ideas that emerge in hackathons and turn them into projects that are viable enough to really benefit a community. One of those things is investment capital to pay people to develop. Uh, the, the prototype into a full application, and the other is a marketplace where people can can find the application and use it. And so we, we think that uh, Open Civic as a platform may be able to help create that market. The other question that has come up uh, that surprised me a little bit is how many apps catalogs do you need? When we built the Civic Commons project initially, we thought the answer was one. We thought there'll be one apps catalog. There'll be all the Civic software in the world, and then uh, for various reasons we realize that that's not really the case. Uh, first of all, there's a multilingual issue, but, but th there are also domain-specific apps catalogs that people are telling us they want to build. The city of New York uh, has all sorts of departments and agencies that, that sponsor apps contests, and they want to have a place to catalog all of the software that they're using there are also topic-specific apps catalogs because software that helps address a problem in sanitation may not really be very useful to solving a problem such as domestic violence or a transportation problem. And then another use case that we've had conversations about is a non-governmental organization that wants to catalog software for pro-democracy activists. And that's a different enough use case. They want a catalog of software, but pro-democracy activists tend to see themselves as oppositional to government. They're exposing corruption or challenging government to change, and they don't necessarily want to be using the same catalog f for software that the government itself is using. They may, may even have security and privacy concerns. And so there's another use case where we've been approached by people who want their own apps catalog. So 
With that, I'm going to pass the podium over to Paul Mackay, who's going to talk about what is being done now with the Open Civic Distro in Europe and Africa. Hello. Um, so I work for an organization called Nesta, which is a UK charity uh, that focuses on fostering and encouraging innovation. And um, it does this through a kind of uh, range of activities. Um, its mission is basically to help people and organizations bring great ideas to life. And it does this through uh, having an impact investment fund to support kind of new startups. Uh, it puts on challenges and hackathons and events like that. And uh, it has a large kind of research arm that does lots of research into effective policy for innovation, how to encourage innovation in different sectors, things like that. There's some examples here of, of some of the types of challenges it's done. Uh, Reboot Britain was one that looked at how to um, uh, support citizens with kind of collaborative, collaborative technology. Uh, Make It Local was about looking at um, local government data and how to kind of open that up and work with digital agencies to provide better, better access to that information for citizens. And the Big Green Challenge was about community-led responses to climate change. So it covers a whole variety of different uh, types of things. Um, another project that, that Nest is um, part of right now is uh, Code for Europe. And um, uh, the basic model of Code for Europe is the same as Code for America, which has been running, it's, Code for America is in its sort of third year now. Uh, the idea is to take kind of technologists and put them to work in, work with local government in a, in a number of cities. So there's sort of six cities participating in Code for Europe this year, which is the first year it's been run. And it, the, the sort of structure there is a little bit different. So a program like this, and there's quite a lot of other programs like this in Europe, um, it's funded by the European Commission, and it's managed by a kind of consortium of organizations, uh, one of which being Nesta, uh, to, to, to run the program. And um, uh, just to kind of go back to the transportation example that Andrew was talking about, um, a couple of the projects that some of the guys are working on, they're both in Helsinki and in Manchester, they're taking a lot of the kind of open source work that's been done already on some of these projects and things like the general transit specification and applying that to the data sets and the, and the um, cases for the transportation authorities in those cities. And they're also working together and kind of taking the, that software, building their own and adapting it to the kind of local needs. Um, so in the sort of kickoff meeting of Code for Europe in uh, January, um, I mean, I, I joined uh, Code for Europe as a, as a Code for Europe fellow, but working directly with Nesta rather than working for a city. And my focus then has been kind of on how to explore this area of how do we encourage collaboration and reuse. So in the kickoff meeting, it was quite apparent that it would make, um, a, you know, a, a key part of sort of what I might work on would be uh, looking at Open Civic, you know, um, contributing towards the development and looking to launch a kind of similar catalog um, for Europe. So. What I'm hoping to kind of uh, start in about the next month is a Europe Commons uh, catalog based on Open Civic, and that'll be a site that can uh, be a place to put certainly all the projects that are coming out of Code for Europe, some of the best patches from um, Code for America, the Code for America Commons, and also work that's been done by organizations uh, around Europe, things like My Society, who've done things like Fix My Street and other um, uh, trans uh, political transparency projects. And Future Gov is another organization in the UK that does a lot around uh, reinventing um, local services. And something else I've been exploring is how to then connect that with um, organizations that are doing, you know, kind of working with local governments. So the Local Government Association is an umbrella organization that works with all the local councils across the UK. So I've been looking to sort of say, well, how could the common site interact with, you know, their sort of um, forums and their, their kind of uh, information portals that they provide already? that are used by local councils. Um, so I've been working with NUAMS on contributing towards Open Civic. One of the main bits of work I've been doing was just adding multilingual support because in Europe, unlike say over here in America, we've, there's a problem of kind of a wide diversity of languages. So that's been one of the main activities I've been doing. And again, with Drupal, that's really easy to provide a really good comprehensive um, solution for that. Um, but another aspect that we're just sort of starting to look at um, again, with Nesta has kind of a lot of uh, expertise in, in, in an area in looking at sort of useful ways of gathering evidence around, you know, how effective are our programs and, and, and applications, things like that. So the Alliance for Useful Evidence is a Nesta-led uh, program around capturing and disseminating best practice about, um, you know, determining useful evidence um, for applications. 
So there's some examples here of you know, different levels of how you can go about gathering evidence and you know, different quality, things like that. So you know, it's one thing to create a catalog of apps, but then you know, there's questions like, well, how much money have these applications saved? Um, you know, how many users are actually using them? You know, so a lot of the time, I think a lot of these civic applications, maybe that data isn't being gathered. So we're hoping to kind of explore how, how more of that could be approached and kind of then maybe built into the, the platform. Um, What's happening as well in other parts of the world, so in Africa, Code for Kenya um, has been a kind of initiating program in Kenya, but then that's kind of now leading to Code for Africa being uh, set up just recently. And uh, Code for Africa is looking to also create a, a, a catalog as well based on Open Civic. Uh, Developing the Caribbean was a, a recent hackathon in the Caribbean. Again, they built this using the Open Civic software, the site for, for running that. They're looking to create a similar catalog for that, that part of the world. Uh, there's activity around this, um, you know, the civic innovation movement happening in Colombia, and a lot of these activities have been kind of sponsored and supported um, through through the World Bank. Um, and it's interesting to note kind of the differences and similarities. So, one of the things about a lot of the civic innovation happening in maybe a place like Africa is that, and this is unlike in say Europe and America, where the civic software is quite often being developed for and run by government. Say, um, quite often here the projects might be actually around, uh, you know, citizen-led. Uh, projects to you know demand greater transparency and accountability of the government you know in the face of kind of corruption and things like that um, and uh, but also there are similarities and one of the things that's in the sort of longer term roadmap for open civic is trying to build something like an investment uh, network kind of platform uh, in there so uh, it will be possible to post projects and uh, for different organizations who don't individually have the resources to support developing that software themselves, they could pledge support, perhaps donate, you know, provide money or develop resources, but basically kind of collaborate on those projects. And that's certainly needed in a place like uh, Africa. But also I was talking to some people working in local councils in the UK and they were expressing exactly the same thing, that it would be very hard for them to develop, um, you know, open source projects kind of just within one council. They're very hard to get the support for that, but being able to kind of collaborate and do it across groups of councils would be much easier. And again, Drupal's a platform that would, you know, really um, can provide a rich uh, set of features for developing those kinds of kind of community uh, um, support. So that's a kind of bit of an overview of what's happening in some other parts of the world. I'm going to hand over to Aaron, who's going to talk about kind of integration with open data. Uh, thanks, Paul. So the applications that we're uh, talking about in these apps catalogs um, w are driven by uh, public data. Um, an application in a, in a civic context uh, is useless without the uh, open data driving it. Um, so the, cor the corollary for um, application catalogs is uh, open data um, catalogs that um, can give people access to the information that um, they need to um, create an application. Uh, so this is a um, photo of the um, basement of the City Hall in Philadelphia. Um, you can see that most of the data here is uh, not in a machine readable format. Um, governments have massive amounts of information. Um, every um, service that you interact with uh, on a daily basis. If you think about the number of government services that you um, that you interacted with between the time that you got up uh, this morning and came in to the conference um, today, uh, you know that's uh, dozens of services alone, and there's um, massive amounts of um, information that governments have about the um, the those services. So um, the challenge right now is not necessarily uh, to um, that that data doesn't exist, but that it's in um, data warehouses that are uh, not accessible um, to to the general public. Um, so this is something that is um, being addressed. Uh, open data portals, uh, catalogs of open data are um, being released uh, here in the U.S. Um, at the federal level, uh, state level. Um, as well as uh, internationally, uh, data.gov was released a couple years ago, um, is the federal data catalog. Um, data.gov.uk is the um, European corollary. Um, 
So yeah, as a developer in a civic uh, context uh, at a hackathon, um, this open data is what you're, um, is necessary to, um, to drive uh, any civic application. Uh, these um, these uh, open data catalogs are um, being provided by several kinds of software. Uh, there are um, proprietary uh, options out there. Uh, Socrata is uh, the most popular one. Um, if you've done any uh, civic hacking, you've probably come across uh, a Socrata portal. Uh, CCAN is the um, most popular uh, open source alternative. Um, it's really taken off in, in Europe. Um, and uh, it's been deployed in uh, a number of contexts uh, here in the US. Um, so at the heart of um, what this software does, uh, it has two main functions. One is to, um, is to list data sets, uh, and the second is to um, uh, offer APIs uh, to access those, access those data sets uh, in machine-readable formats so that um, folks that are creating applications that go into something like, that are listed in something like OpenCivic um, can have a way of interacting with that data uh, that isn't um, locked in, in a warehouse under City Hall. Um, so data sets themselves contain um, metadata about information about um, the data that uh, they house um, and contain resources that um, are often um, in machine readable formats like CV CSV uh, and are often also in um, blob files, PDFs um, that are less accessible formats. So this is an example of an uh, open data set that um, is available right now on um, our uh, DCAN demo site. I'm going to introduce DCAN in a second, but um, here's um, polling places in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and another um, feature of the, some of the data portal software is that um, you get, a, um, along with the API um, and ability to access the data, you can, you can preview it as well. Um, so we've been lucky enough to uh, use CCAN um, to deploy um, CCAN ourselves for uh, the city of Chicago. Um, CCAN is a really um, uh, beautifully written software. Uh, it's written Python, it's very MVC. From a developer perspective, um, there's a lot of really um, things that they've done really well. Um, we came a couple, across a couple problem areas with that software that um, made us want to um, bring some of that f those features into Drupal. Um, one is that uh, folks want to use um, Drupal alongside um, an open data portal such as um, CCAN, and there are integration issues there um, that can take a lot of developer time and um, are problematic. And then um, CCAN itself um, is a s part of it, part of that uh, open data portal um, um, uh, what an open data portal is, is a, is a CMS. Uh, and from um, the perspective of folks that have used Drupal, um, not being able to do um, certain things like uh, add users through the, um, uh, through the UI or uh, just going able to um, uh, content types and creating a new content type or architecting a new um, data model, um, in Drupal, you're just used to that, and, and uh, other um, CMSs are just not as full featured. So, um, and this is a problem not just uh, for us, but um, data.gov uses uh, Drupal, um, uh, uh, um, data.gov.uk uh, has tried to integrate uh, Drupal and CCAN um, to varying degrees of success. So, um, about six, nine months ago, we said, wait, uh, why can't we just create an open data portal uh, that has the features of, of CCAN and Drupal? And yay, we did. <laughs> um, so that uh, project right now lives on uh, Drupal.org, um, uh, Drupal.org slash project slash DCAN. Um, it's still in development, but it's already been deployed 
uh, in a number of places. Um, uh, da uh, data Wisconsin uh, in what is now my um, home, well, the, where I live uh, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, we've created datawisconsin.org, which is uh, um, using CCAN, or DCAN, excuse me. <laughs> um, so uh, it's still in development, but um, it's gotten um, a lot of traction already. Um, so I, DCAN allows us to um, do public, data, public sector data management uh, within um, Drupal. There's two other elements that I'm going to uh, mention about DCAN that um, allow us to um, circle back to, to Open Civic. Um, We've uh, broken up the key features of um, a data portal um, into uh, two modules that um, can be um, installed and activated, uh, installed and enabled on um, any Drupal site. Um, and these are also on Drupal.org. There's the um, DCAN dataset module, which um, does the um, dataset listing. And there's a data store module that uh, creates an API for um, files that are uploaded uh, in a delimited uh, form. So the, um, what's exciting to us about this is that uh, any uh, Drupal site, Drupal 7 site, can now um, be an OBIT data portal with many of the features um, that the proprietary um, world is trying to offer cities, um, as well as um, some of the other um, options out there. Um, so that's. Uh, very exciting for us. So, um, and also allows us uh, with Open Civic to um, have instances that uh, have all of the um, application catalog features, uh, the community features, uh, as well as um, being in um, allowing instances to be uh, open data portals. So, I'm going to hand it back over to Andrew. Great. So just to uh, sum all that up, you know, why, why do we think Open Civic matters? Well, we think that it can really not only be make Drupal a great platform to build a civic application for a government, but can also kind of be part of the infrastructure for civic tech development itself. Um, and why do we think that? Uh, well, it, Drupal is very open standards friendly. We all know and love that. Uh, of course, it not only is open source, but it plays nicely with other open source uh, uh, packages. Um, it is a community platform at its core. Uh, it's very good at helping people to collaborate, um, and that's a key use case for actually uh, collaborative civic software development. Um, and then finally, it uh, deals now well with, with the addition of these DCAN features with open data. Um, so we think in aggregate, uh, open civic can really help to uh, move the needle in terms of uh, civic innovation. Um, in the U.S. and now worldwide. And just to give you a sense of why we think that matters, again, to reinforce the, the kind of dollars we're talking about here for government software and technology spend are pretty remarkable. Um, you know, just at the federal level alone, the U.S. technology, in the U.S. alone, the, the Technology CEO Council estimated that if you could optimize sharing of software, hardware, and data at the federal level alone, you could save a trillion dollars by 2020. Um, and then you look at all the other governments that invest in technology, um, that buy it and build it, and by and large don't share it. Um, you've got you know, all the different states in the U.S. alone. You've got all the different towns and cities in the U.S. alone. You've got the different branches of government, judiciary, legislative, executive uh, in the U.S. And you've got all the different thematic silos of labor and environments and motor vehicles, each of which, by and large, have their own systems, their own data standards, their own ways of doing civic technology in ways that are very difficult to share and, more often than not, very interoperable. And there's huge inefficiency in that in terms of both cost and efficacy. And what we're, better, what we're, at, what we're after, uh, once again, is better government that costs less money and perhaps can even help create new, uh, really innovative businesses and, and new jobs to boot. So um, with that, please uh, go to the project on Drupal.org and get involved if you're interested. Ask us for help, give us ideas, because um, we're really excited about it, and it's going to be a big investment for our whole team over the next year, um, and we really need your help. So thank you, and with that, we'll take some questions if there's some time. Oh, and we're having a, 
open data birds of a feather at 345 today. Um, so if you're interested in uh, having a deeper conversation about Drupal and open data, uh, please come to that. So any questions? Hey, so I was interested in that last slide where a trillion dollars, and uh, I was just kind of wondering, have you, like that trillion dollars, I would assume, uh, represents an existing spend towards existing licenses or businesses or something like that. I mean, we're, that's money we're spending now, right? So have you got any feedback from industry or, or some of the major players on, because that, that looks like a fight to me between like free market and open data, like the taxpayers, basically, because what you're talking about benefits taxpayers. Yeah, I mean, well, everybody in, in, in many ways. But I was yeah. just kind of wondering, is there a conflict between so we're, stakeholders? I mean, some, some of our federal f friends in the room might be able to speak to this better than, better than we. But um, you know, we don't look at it as an anti-business you know, business or anti-anybody thing at all. I mean, and we all are competing, or many of us are competing with you know, big, established enterprise proprietary platforms in Drupal content management systems, not for government as well, right? I mean, Dries, Dries spoke to it pretty uh, at great length yesterday. Uh, you know, the, the uh, competitors from Adobe and Oracle and all the rest are the same competitors in these other software domains as well. And you know, I think uh, you know, the, the market will, will decide if we can provide, if we can innovate better and faster and in a way that provides more options for governments to either bring technologies in-house and maintain them in-house and extend them in-house and then share those results with their peers. And if that is, in fact, an innovation benefit and or a cost savings, then I think open source will win and some of that dollar savings will be realized. Um, but, uh, and that's not specific to Drupal, it's not even specific to software, it goes for, for data and data licenses and hardware and open hardware uh, potentially as well. So, um, you know, I think the biggest companies will move uh, with where the, where the wind blows and if we can prove that this model actually works better, I think the biggest companies in the world will build great businesses around it and supporting it. It'll just force them to be uh, to be nimble and to and to innovate, which I think is a good thing for them and for everybody else. Yeah. Hey Andrew, um, just wanted to um, look a bit about part of the the open data and the open um, open source is about sort of changing the culture of government and changing the culture of how things are done in our society. And I think a, a lot of or a lot of governments get excited about open data because it's flashy and it's new and they can get some media, media spin about it and it seems like it's you know something that they can do that to, to show that they're innovating, but it doesn't get any deeper than that sort of surface level of of you know hey look we held a hackathon isn't that cool we can do something for the youth just like the skate park that we've got and, you know they get excited get some new media t attention and and uh, nothing nothing changes underneath the on the procurement level on the on the sort of understanding of of remixing you know, remixing how things are done as opposed to just the, the, uh, the individual tools that are used. Um, are, there, are there opportunities here to go off and to try and, and remix the culture that, uh, that are, are of, of the government and to try and say what are the best practices of, of departments who are really innovating at a much deeper level than, than just, you know, organizing a hackathon? Yeah. Do, you, do you want to speak to that at all, Paul, from the, the work that Nesta does to evaluate uh, efficacy? Or no, I can tackle it if not. Um, sure. So, uh, from from my perspective, yeah, I mean, it's it's it sounds great to to build an app. Um, it looks great when in the federal government. Uh, you know, I uh, don't have this firsthand knowledge, but secondhand, I've heard sort of that there was a mad rush when data.gov was launched to get all these map shape files out on there because it, there's a whole lot of them and it would make the number of data sets released look really good. Um, and that's not necessarily. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great, but it also isn't necessarily. Um, the, the press release is not what we're going for, nor is the, you know, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with having fun at a hackathon over a weekend, but if you're really saying you want to help human beings deal with the problem in their communities, you really need to measure outcomes and need to do so longitudinally over time, right? And make, figure out if you're a hackathon funder or investor, if you will, whether it, it actually is making a difference. And that's actually the idea of systematizing these processes and actually having, for example, a hackathon platform that the World Bank is going to propagate across a lot of different thematic domains and literally uh, across every continent is so that you can have the ability to be capturing metadata from all of those instances of it, aggregate that and analyze it. And, such, and also to connect the context where new uh, proposed solutions are being hacked on to actual sort of app stores where people that just need a solution and need it even commercially supported 
may go to find it, and then creating a, a virtuous cycle like that. So the, we're early days for sure, but I think the idea of having a platform and having standards that are used for that whole cycle is gonna make, uh, help give us the metadata that we need to figure out what's working and what's not. Um, so it is a lot about systematizing it. Did you wanna add anything? Um, yeah, maybe, um, maybe a couple of things. I mean, one thing that Nest is kind of uh, thinking a bit about um, along similar lines is, you know, you can put on hackathons and things, but um, it's important to do the preparation up front with hackathon and be really clear on kind of what you're trying to build. But then also, you know, sometimes hackathons put on prizes, but there's sort of a chasm between then sort of jumping from that to say actually creating a startup, you know, and starting to build a business that's actually going to provide kind of a new real service, a new innovation. And so, you know, we're, we're sort of nested looking at that and trying to kind of see, well, actually, how can you bridge that gap? And, and you know, what, what, what are the right kind of investments? There's another program, you know, I'm part of Coach Europe. There's another program called Apps for Europe, which is, again, a sort of similar kind of structured um, program in Europe looking at providing kind of business mentoring and, uh, you know, sort of uh, guidance towards other funding opportunities after hackathons, like during the hackathons event as part of that. Um, I mean, another thing I think, a theme we're noticing, so in one of the slides I mentioned FutureGov, um, one project they're doing is called Patchwork. And I think it's a really good example where, and this isn't particularly an open source project or anything, but, but um, FutureGov focus really heavily on, um, you know, sort of software uh, services and uh, your know, service and, and change kind of thing and um, what's what's important about that is that you know they're, they're sort of just turning the model on its head so it's, it's, it's a project that uh, provide you know looks at sort of social care and so right now you know if you've got an individual a citizen you know they're going to require sort of they're going to have to talk to probably a whole bunch of different people it, to get all the full capacity of social care that, that's involved and that's just you know expensive and time wasting for them and you know complicated and so what Patchwork are doing is saying, right, let's get hold of all the different data sets that different government departments at the local level have. They're building then some software that puts the kind of the person right at the center of kind of those interactions and uses the data kind of to, you know, build some software around providing a much better picture for then all of the people who are providing those services to, the, to that individual. So, uh, so I think, so, so what, what we're noticing is there's a really important service design point to this, to this kind of work, you know, in terms of actually innovating in the sort of civic space, it's you know as well as building the interesting software that can help facilitate some of that. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say one thing about because you you talked about real change versus change that's just for publicity, and uh, you know governments like other institutions certainly have plenty of people in them who resist real change, but there are some forcing factors that are driving real change. One is you know budget cuts and the need to deliver services at some level, regardless. And other thing, another big forcing factor for open data is freedom of information laws. And governments have to comply with those. And if someone contacts a local government agency and wants information about crime statistics, the, 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 the city clerk or county clerk or whoever it is has to provide that. And they get really tired of having to dig through paper files or come up with printouts for people who who inundate them with those requests. And, and so there's actually quite a bit of desire on the part of governments to save themselves a lot of headache by having it an open data portal so that when someone asks for something like that, they don't have to you know, spend time digging through files themselves. They can just say, go to the open data portal and <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, I think we have time for one, one last uh, quick question. Sure. Uh, going back to um, the data that still exists out there and the picture of all the boxes and warehouse, the data warehouses, what is the plan or is there a plan? I know that there's a plan going forward that this initiative is for open data and op open government, but what do we do with all that historical data sitting around? Do they only provide that or will they ever cre make that machine readable in general or is that is that something people are not thinking about yet? I know with the city of Philadelphia, they have um, just volu uh, volumes practically as big as that photo of um, old records that they're trying to, um, I know there is a um, process that they're trying to um, digitize those, um, but the, the, the kind of, the, they're um, doing it very slowly, but the demand for that um, is increased by um, more participation in um, and, and the more that in, in just civic um, engagements in general and, and use of um, these applications, because the, the more that people actually use something that's being driven by open data, the more the demand, there's the demand for it, and the more that um, there's pressure to 
to um, to do to, to provide that information. So, I mean, I could say specifically for Philadelphia, I know that they are digitizing their records, uh, old records, but I know that they um, are not going to accomplish that for a long time. Yeah, and it's, it's part of the, all the policies that get written and passed in New York City. One of the first uh, sort of arguments against an open data law when it was being debated back, I think, in 2010 was that it was going to cost, you know, a billion dollars to digitize, you know, five years of historical records. And when this lo uh, local law was passed, uh, some 18 months later, uh, it called for going forward uh, publishing of, of new data that's being created and uh, left really left out uh, historical data. Um, but I think the again, demand will drive uh, investment in terms of what historical data is actually valuable. Um, there's a whole emerging community of practice around open data laws and how to write them in ways that are actually strike the balance between not being able to have unlimited spending to put data online, but also really uh, driving the kind of transparency that we need and the kind of uh, efficiency gain potential that is inherent in publishing the data that government creates and uses in doing its work. Um, so come to the BOF at 345 if you're interested in that more. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed and appreciated the chance to talk to you about this today.